Hello and welcome back to Shattered Lives, the Irish Daily Star's crime podcast. I'm Paul Healy, I'm Chief Reporter with the Irish Daily Star, and I'm joined today by Michael O'Toole, Crime Correspondent with the Irish Daily Star. And we're going to talk today about the case of Irene White. Irene was a mother of three. She was brutally stabbed to death as she did her dishes in her home in Ice Hill, Dundalk, on the 6th of April 2005. Her sister Anne launched a tireless campaign for justice that ultimately led to Irene's killer Anthony Lamb and middleman Niall Power being convicted over her murder. However, Anne died tragically in August 2019 before being able to see the so-called mastermind of this murder face justice. To this day, that man is still free and the guard investigation into him remains open. So I'm going to talk to Mick without further ado about this case. Uh, Mick, you're, you're well versed in this. You covered it from day one. Um, can you remember that day, the 6th of April 2005? I'll be honest, Paul, I was actually over in Rome for the funeral of Pope John Paul II. So that's why it, it stays in my mind, because it's one of the few murders that I didn't attend on the day of. So you're right, it was the it was the 6th of April 2005. Um, so I was away and I think all attention was largely focused on the funeral of the Pope. It was really it, it was really, really a huge story. I mean, it was the, the front page story for, for all papers for the week, shall we say. But the murder of Irene White, it really was shocking. And it, I've been working on it effectively from day one, even though I was away. I was involved in covering the story. And um, it's, a, it's a murder that stayed with me for a long time. You, you mentioned Anne Lucassian, and we'll talk about Anne. Her campaign was absolutely fantastic. But there were, this is a classic epitome of a murder case that has so many twists and turns that I think we should really talk about this. But you're right, it's in one way it's solved because two men are currently serving life sentences for this murder, but it's not fully solved because the, the mastermind, the man guard, be believe, organised and paid for the killing is free. Now, there are developments expected sometime this year about this because we know that Detectives in Dundalk, where she was murdered, have sent a file to the Director of Public Prosecutions. And we always say this, guards take it to a certain level. After that, they do their bit. And after that, it's up for the law officer, the DPP, to decide if there's going to be a charge. There is a level of optimism that there will be a charge. Uh, and we can talk about that. So it could happen while we're recording this. We d- nobody gets any prior notification. It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. It could be six months down the road. But I think there is a level of confidence that they're, you know, I think they're 90% there with the charge, but that's all, always the final decision for the law officer. I mean, can you recall, uh, obviously, as you've mentioned, the Pope visit, but in covering this crime, and I mean, you, you know yourself, as as do I, when we, when we cover a crime of this magnitude, it isn't really long before the finger is pointed at certain individuals. Um, this mastermind that we're speaking about, obviously, who we can't identify, were they, was the finger pointed at them from early on? Very much so. Within, I'm not even going to say within weeks, uh, de- within days, if not sooner. So, you know, that person was immediately a person of interest. Now, um, how can I put this? They had a rock solid alibi for the day. Uh, they were caught in CCTV cameras at a, an event. Uh, dozens of CCTV cameras. So that it was clear that person was not the murderer. But we've spoken about this in other pods, Paul. You can order a murder, you can organise a murder, you can conspire to be a murderer, and there's this concept of common cause. So if you and I decide to murder someone and you carry out the murder, but I tell you to murder, carry it out, you can be done for murder and I can be done for murder. So, you know, just because they didn't, and we can talk about the, the death of Irene, it was a particularly bloody murder, just because they didn't actually carry out the murder doesn't mean they can't be charged with murder. And that's, I mean, we'll talk about this now, Power fella. He wasn't the murderer, but he's currently doing life for murder. So there is, there is, a, uh, there's, there was a definite conspiracy of people. They have two out of three and they're moving towards a third person. Mm. And I, I, I will we'll speak about the two that were, were done for it in a bit, but I'm, I'm just curious, like, I suppose in, in about those early days, you know, and then just in researching the case myself, obviously I'm familiar with it from covering it, but, but, but you were there from day one. When did the, can you recall the revelation about her diary, that she had a diary and um, supposedly there was an entry in it where she had actually said that this person, uh, she feared that this person was going to kill her. And I think that person even said that they would have an alibi and that they wouldn't get caught. Yeah, um, I'm going to be honest, I don't remember the specific time. My sense is 
that came out quite some time afterwards. If you remember, I mean, people may remember this. There, and we can talk about this. There was a cold case investigation, which was around 2012. So that was six years after the murder. Um, and there had been, a, a, I mean, I was involved in this. I was talking to Anne Vilcassian, Irene's sister. I kept the pot boiling. Anne really kept the pot boiling. She was, you know, she was really, really active. So I think, I, I think it was around 2012, around that time, because, you know, RTE, Barry Cummins and RTE did an awful lot of stellar work. So my suspicion is it wasn't, I may be proved wrong on this, but I don't think it was in the first three or four months, because I think it was a, a revelation that came out much later on. But she, I think she had told friends, didn't she, that she was concerned about uh, this person who we are being cautious about uh, identifying and that she was concerned for her safety. I suppose that's the chilling aspect of it, isn't it, that... Um, that she knew, and I, I, I've seen, I've seen interviews with friends of hers that uh, they would now say that they regret how they handled that, in that they feel maybe they didn't take her seriously enough, or they thought perhaps I, I think she was saying things of, of the nature that am I am I taking this too seriously? But she, she had the wherewithal to tell people that she was concerned for her safety. I mean, it's just the chilling aspect to it, isn't it? It 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 is, and you know, I think an enough lot of people, if 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 somebody was to say that. I wonder, would you necessarily take them seriously? Because you'd sit there and go, ah, ah, come on, Irene. Ah, no, I, I don't think that'll happen. So, you know, I, I think people are understandably, I'm not going to say they they would dismiss it, but they might take it with a pinch of salt. And I, I, I you know, obviously Irene thought, looking back, she, she was obviously worried about her life being at risk, but I just wonder how many people, if they were told that, would they would they act on it? I think the natural reaction would be, ah, oh, Jesus, I think you're overstating this, Irene, a wee bit. I think that's fair. Yeah. Just uh, want to talk about the crime itself, because you've you, you you've signalled it there just in, in opening the conversation about it. It was a particularly barbaric attack, wasn't it? Yes. So uh, Irene lived in a place called Icehouse Hill in the centre of uh, Dundalk in County Louth. Um, and she had dropped off, she was a mother of three, as you say, and she dropped off her kids to school and she went back and she was she was effectively doing the dishes when she was attacked. Now, I've covered lots of murders and I, I actually, I found the details about this a few weeks later. She was stabbed 34 times and I, I don't mean to be gruesome, but this has been reported and her throat was slit. Now, that by any stretch of the imagination is a horrific crime. and. I know that investigators looked at that and they realised that it was frenzied and they did think that such a level of frenzy would indicate that there was a personal grudge. So in other words, it wasn't a burglar who Arian had disturbed because a burglar, well, first of all, a burglar would more than likely run. Very, very rare that a burglar would take anybody on. Um, but say, you know, on a very, very rare chance, a burglar did decide to attack someone who confronted them. I don't think any burglar would do that. 34 stab wounds and, and slit in somebody's throat. So that led Gardy to believe that, you know, she would have had a connection with the killer and it would have been so frenzied that there was a grudge. And also there was no sign of a break-in. So that did lead Gardy to believe perhaps she let the killer into the house. So maybe there, there was sort of some connection, but there was another, I mean, and she was found, and this is really upsetting, her aged mother Maureen, uh, was living in a mobile phone, home, mobile phone, sorry, at home, sorry, at the back of the house in the garden. And she went in. Now, it was about half 12. The murder guard, I think, happened about a quarter past 10. But uh, morning went in to have a cup of tea with her daughter, as was her daily routine. And it was her, unfortunately, who discovered Irene dead. She, her, she was slumped at the dishwasher. At, at the beside the sink, and she was, and there was a pool of blood. And there was a, well, you can imagine with that level of violence, um, there was a significant amount of blood. There were pools of blood all around her. So, God love Maureen, the poor mother who was, who subsequently uh, died on. Uh, Irene was forty three when she died. Maureen actually died on Irene's forty fourth birthday. So, I mean, the family would have said that the shock of finding her daughter dead contributed to that death because it was it was it was a few months later but could you just imagine Maureen what would have gone through her head when she finds her daughter dead and horrifically murdered so it really was it was certainly one of the most violent and really gruesome murders that there has been in Ireland for quite a long time
It's shocking. I found that particularly harrowing when I, I, I only in researching the case really today in detail uh, did I find out that fact that, that her mother died on on her birthday. I'm just that's what a horrendous tragedy. Um, and she had the strength. In fairness, Maureen had the strength to to run from that scene to the local shop and raise the alarm, didn't she? And um, that's that's what. That's what alerted the guards to the scene. Yes, and there's a doctor, sir, just across the road from it. Uh, and the doctor was called, but look, obviously at that stage, it was merely a, a question of pronouncing dead. There was nothing anybody could do for her. And as I said, you know, the, the, the reason guards believe it was at about a quarter past 10 was because there was a ma- Ice House Hill where Irene lived. It backed onto Ice House Hill Park and it was quite, it's quite a well-known park in Dundalk. And there was a man wearing a cap stocky and well built seen running across Ice House Hill Park at about a quarter past ten so he was very quickly identified as the main suspect and the person of interest and I think it actually was him as it turns out he ran to O'Handle Park which is Rep's site and, and drove away so look you can imagine serious murder investigation was launched and they did look at certain people and one person as we've said quickly emerged as a, a person of uh, interest in the case but unfortunately the case went cold didn't it because they just didn't get the breaks they needed um that particular person you mentioned had an alibi and it wasn't as i suppose clear cut as maybe they originally thought it was in that if it was this person um that person seemed to be in a, in a place they shouldn't have been so it, it became a much more complicated investigation yes so by this stage look obviously 2006 i remember and this is where Anne Delcassian, Irene's sister, who was living in, in Chester in England, really enters the, the fray. We, we we cover lots of murders. And, it, you know, they talk about the, 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 the sort of 24-hour period. And a lot of murders are solved within the, the first 24 hours because there's clues. There may even be admissions. People may be found at the scene and, and that sort of stuff. So, you know, I can remember first couple of days, first couple of weeks, there was it was a heightened interest in the case and there were hopes that somebody would be brought to justice. But as you say, the, the main suspect had a, a, I mean, it was a real, you could not have hoped for a better alibi. So once that person had an alibi, Gardy quickly realised that if he was involved in it, he got somebody else to do it. And there was a conspiracy and conspiracies are very hard to break down because you have to get, you have to break other people's alibis. You have to find out who did it. So in 2006, Irene really got involved and she started agitating uh, sorry, uh, uh, her sister Anne, sorry, Anne got involved and she started agitating. Just really, and it was a masterstroke really to keep people interested. So she started giving interviews, she started doing things. She organised a, a vigil for Anne outside the, the murder scene in 2006. Now, uh, Anne's, Irene's husband, Anne, was estranged from uh, Irene at the time of the murder and he didn't attend the the, the vigil. But there was there were about 50 people there and it got significant uh, public and press interest and that's really I think you know maybe uh, say from 2006 when that happened up until let's say 2010 2011 she, she did various things she had lots of interviews she there was in 2008 there was a 10,000 euro reward offered by Gardy part of Crime Stoppers and, and Gardy do that after a certain amount of time just in the hope that somebody does have information and the money will make them come forward. Now, Anne actually decided to go one better than that. She put in €24,000 of her own money. I think it was about £20,000. So she added to that. So it effectively turned out to be €34,000. Now, there was a hope that that would make somebody come forward because I think by this stage, Gardy would have been quite satisfied that there was a large conspiracy. You know, you're talking maybe seven or eight people would have either had involvement in it or would have known about it. Say, for example, the killer drove away in a car and that car was covered in blood. He was covered in blood because of the frenzied nature of the attack. Who cleaned his clothes? Who did he go to? Who did he tell? So there was a cabal. And I remember talking to Anne about this. She thought personally around seven or eight people herself. And I I think that makes sense, as as we'll discuss later on. There were a a couple of people brought to justice about it, but they, you know, there were others involved. So Anne really kept the pot boiling and I think you know there's there's one point of interest for this a lot of families I have to say on Garda advice and you'll you'll know this Paul a lot of families of murder victims don't talk to journalists they're advised not to talk to journalists journalists by Garda how many times have we knocked on doors or contacted people and said oh the guards told us not to talk now I can understand why guards do that 
I think it's anti-intellectual myself because, and the Anne Del Cassian case is a perfect example of this because really, Anne kept Irene's case in the public eye. And I think, I'm not going to say Gardy had forgotten about it because I know there were real fantastic Gardy and the doc who were working away on this, but it fades from the public perception. And, you know, that can be an unconscious thing or maybe other stories come along or maybe other cases come along for Guardian to Doc. We know about, you know, the murder of Adrian Donahue, for example. And, you know, so other cases do happen. So I think Anne played a central role in keeping the public and the media interested, which I think, I'll put it this way, I think Gar- kept Guardy with their nose to the grindstone. Do, do you know what I'm saying by that? Absolutely. And that puts the pressure then, uh, like you mentioned, what, seven or eight people involved. When you have a conspiracy on that level, it's inevitable, isn't it, that someone will break. Someone on the on the peripherals of it may break. And if you have that kind of public pressure, I mean, that 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 certainly helps. You, it kind of reminds me of the, of the murder of Rachel O'Reilly, you know, in that her parents as well, they very much kept that case alive and the public interest in it alive. And by the time Joe O'Reilly was on trial, I mean, the, the, the level of public interest was massive, but that kept that case alive as well. So it shows you the importance of it. But uh, talking about that that pressure, um, do you want to talk about Australia and uh, we got to that point or am I getting ahead of myself? Yes, so, uh, no, slightly, but I just, I mentioned one thing in 2009, as I said, Alan, Alan White, the businessman, was estranged for Irene before the murder. So there's the question of the house. He was living elsewhere. 2009, the house was, was now it's a really big house. I'm not going to say it was a mansion, but it was a good big house. Like, you know, those sort of Georgian houses you see on their own big big square one. And now that was at the height of the, the property frenzy. And it was sold for 1.1 million. And Alan White. He sold it, so that's it. The money went in. Now there are, there are, there were before and died. She had launched a legal fight over Irene's estate because she would have been entitled to half of that because it, it's an estate. Now, obviously, uh, Anne died in August 2019, so I have to check on the up on the status of that because Anne's husband Kenny might still be keeping the, the legal action, and there are other legal actions he's taken but anyway 2009 that sold so that was just <clears throat> excuse me that was just another story but something really interesting happened 2011 2012 <clears throat> at that stage it was referred to the Garda cold case inquiry which is the serious crime review team i prefer we prefer calling it cold case now what they do is it's a sort of misnomer they don't take over the investigation the investigation stays with the the way the guards work. It's the district officer, the local superintendent, who's charged with the investigation. So it was always a Dundalk investigation. But as I said, they're called the Serious Crime Review Team. So what they do is they're experts from Harcourt Square. They come in and they review the case. So the, um, the Serious Crime Review Team did come in and they did review it. Now, around this time, there was a... Uh, Barry Cummins and RT did a... a one of, he's very good at doing lookbacks. And he did, I think it was at prime time or something like that about the murder of Irene White. And as a result of that, or maybe it was a, a standalone show, as a result of that, Gardy got an anonymous, a series of anonymous phone calls in which a student from Castle Blaney called Anthony Lamb was fingered as the suspect. But they had nothing on him and the evidence, the, the, all the evidence against him was an anonymous. So you, you'll understand, Paul, people, Gardy do get anonymous calls all the time and some can be malicious and some can be genuine but the serious crime review team came along looked at him did some investigating and i think the, the guards in Dundalk had also been investigating lamb and they knew that he had been working he was from uh castle anybody which is to the uh, west of Dundalk, but he had been working in Dundalk at the time so they were obviously very interested in him and one of the things that the serious crime review team suggested was find the person who made the anonymous calls so in 2016, um, this is when it got really serious. There's a, a the detective inspector at the time was a man called Pat Murray, one of the most famous investigators in Ireland. We've I've interviewed him loads. Very very well known. He was central to the uh, Adrian Donahue murder investigation, for example, and he's a real real top investigator. And he brought in, as I said, Anthony Lamb was from Castle Blaney. Now uh, uh, Pat Murray did a, a really really smart thing. He brought in. Uh, a guard from Castle Blaney to help with the investigation because he would know the lie of the land. And it was a fellow called Bobby Ogle, who is very, very well known within the guards, but he wouldn't be publicly known. One of the one of the best investigators you could ever come across. And he was tasked with 
finding the the woman who made the anonymous call because that was obviously the key. Now, there were ne- in in the anonymous calls, she obviously didn't say who she was, but there were nineteen pieces of information. And you and I have done this, Paul. You and I have looked at things and put together a jigsaw, but we haven't found a murder suspect or or a witness. And this is a brilliant story. There were 19 pieces of information and Bobby Ogle worked them all together, put them all together and realised it was one person and he got found out who she was. Now, the only problem was it was someone who used to know this Anthony Lamb guy. The only problem was she was living in Australia. Okay. So he then uh, uh, got permission from the senior management in Dundalk chief superintendent and the superintendent agreed for him for Bobby Ogle and another guard to go over to Australia and literally do and you what I do what you and I do because he has no powers in, in Australia he had to go and do what you and I would call a doorstep right and I know this for a fact he went up to the door knocked on it the lady opened the door and said how you doing and Bobby Ogle my guard from Dundalk I'm investigating the murder of Varian White can I talk to you right which is brilliant right and she just said yes and brought him in and told him the whole story. So essentially this person had been in a relationship with Anthony Lamb. And on the day of the murder, they met each other. I think they, 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 he was flying to England for her graduation. And she, came for, she gave information, basically how he, had, how he was so nervous. And effectively, she gave a full statement to Guardian, which she implicated him. I think she said he confessed to it in various stages along the way. So the guards had their trump card. Right, and that's a re- and she was she was more than happy to give evidence, and she was going to and there were ve- now what the guards have to do is to go have to go and corroborate everything she said, and it took them months. That was twenty sixteen, took them months to do it. You know, mobile they couldn't even do mobile phone data, but have to find out where he was at the time, see if any could back up various things that she said in her statement, and they did. So, um, they in late in in January twenty seventeen they had all their ducks in a row, and they went and arrested Anthony Lamb, okay, and he was completely shocked. And they had him in the car and they were bringing him back to Dundalk Garda Station and he confessed to Bobby Ogle. He admitted it, right? So you can imagine what it was. Now, they can't, you can't take it in a car, obviously. So they, they got him in the, in the interview room and he confessed the whole thing. And he named two people, the mastermind and another man who we'll talk about in a while and said they gave him money. They forced him. He, he said that they... they that they offered him 30,000 euro to carry out the murder. They actually paid him 2,000 euro and they wouldn't give him the rest. He backed out at one stage. He tr- Remember, this was April 2005 that she was murdered. In March 2005, he had tried to kill her, but he couldn't do it. Okay, And he told them and they threatened him. They threatened to kill him. And he effectively told Gardy this stage before he carried out the murder, he felt if he didn't murder her, he would be murdered himself. So he told how he went and he murdered Irene White. Now, if we remember back a few minutes ago, we were talking about how frenzied the attack was, okay? And the whole thing about, was it a grudge and everything? He was asked, about, and this is one of the things that has stayed with me in my career. He was asked about, why was it so violent? And his his answer stuck with me. He said, look, once I started, I had to make sure she was dead. So he stabbed her 34 times and slit her throat just to make sure, because she'd obviously seen him. And in his mind, she he had to make sure that she couldn't survive this. So he went to the extremes to make sure she was dead. And that has always been very chilling with me, just the whole, how callous is that that he just said, right, I'm killing her and I'm going to make sure she's dead. Horrendous. And and am I right in saying, I, I've, I've, I've read an interview there with Pat Murray where he mentioned... Um, he mentioned that supposedly he he had been given uh, lamb had been given instructions on how specifically to kill her which was to stab her twice in the heart i think and that did not you know do the job so to speak and as you as you said in in the moment then he had to as he said make sure that she was dead and he carried out that frenzied attack but he tried to carry out the, uh, as instructed to, and then that shows you the callous nature of the person who ordered him to do this. That he they they wanted it done even in such a specific manner. Uh, but obviously, I think she look. Obviously, she fought for her life, didn't she? I mean, she fought back, and it was. Uh, you know. Yeah, but look, Anthony Lamb. If 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 we talk about, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Take my 
Why is this happening? I'm I'm getting p- uh, feedback, but if you can hear me, it's fine. Um. Anthony Lamb was a big strapping fella. And if you listen, if if you remember a few minutes ago, we were talking about the suspect running across the park. He was a big strappy fella and it was him. So look, she really had no chance. I think he was a rugby player or a body, but you know, something really, really big. Now, there's a couple of interesting aspects about this. He admitted, or he, not admitted, he told the detectives that he had been sexually abused as a child. And that led him, as for many victims, led him into addiction. And one of the, he was drunk, drink and drugs. And he was really playing with his life when he was in 2005 and he was in a really bad way. So I think that the the people who ordered him to do this knew this and they preyed on him and they sort of blackmailed him into doing it. But there's one thing that always stuck with me. He told the detectives, so, so the murder was in 2005, tw- 2017, he was arrested. He told the detectives that on several occasions, he, for, he well, he was suicidal after the murder. But on several occasions, he tried and decided to approach the dark RD, hand himself in, and admit it. But he never did. And then, uh, and the guard said this in his when he was sentenced. He was he became involved in charity. He went to study in Maynooth. He was studying some like, human rights, something like that, you know, or development. And it's as if. He was trying to make amends for what he had done. He was, I mean, we have pictures of him running marathons and stuff for charity. And he really was a pillar of society. And you could see that he was trying to wash away this stain. But I think once the knock came, he knew the game was up and there was no, you know, some people might say stare at a wall and take no comment. He spilled his guts. So he was charged with murder. And then 2018, he went on trial. Do you think, let me just stop you there, uh, just curious, do, do you, I know we can't read minds, but based off your understanding of the case, do you think that he thought by fessing up as much as he did and implicating other people that, that he perhaps would have got a lesser charge, that he wouldn't have ended up facing the ultimate charge? Or was it kind of clearing his conscience and it was it, it needed to be done? No, I, I very much think it was clearing his conscience. I think the sense I got, and this is mad, that it was a relief to him because he'd been living a lie for 12 years and it's a very serious lie. You took someone's life in the most barbaric of circumstances. And as I said, he had been involved in charity. He was trying to do a lot of good. So I think he was tormented by what he had done. And I think I would have been explained that he felt a, a, a weight lifting off him when he had invented it. So his secret life was over. Did, did he have any prior relationship or connection with Irene White at all? Um, he would have. I'm going to mention somebody in a minute and he would have known that person. But it's. I don't think he would ever have met Irene White. I'll put it that way. I'm not sure, but I, I would be of the belief that he didn't. So. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I do, I just. I mean, obviously, he was. He was. He was offered money, and he didn't get all the money that he was offered. But I find it extraordinary just that somebody would, let alone one person, forget forget about two up to three people or whatever, that they would agree willingly agree uh, to carry out a murder on someone's behalf. Like it's obviously it's happened, but it's it's an extraordinary thing to imagine, isn't it? That that you would agree to do something like that for somebody. Imagine the hold somebody would have over you to get you to carry something like that out. I think that's the point, Paul. Th- these people 100% had a hold on him. I think he was afraid of them. Uh, and he did. Th- and I do think he did think they would kill him. But but that's after the, the first botched effort. And he did. And he did think they were going to kill him. But I think he was in their grip. Uh, and he was afraid of him before that. So I think he, and he wanted the money and he was in a bad place. As I say, drink and drugs, he had addiction issues. So he obviously made wrong decisions. Uh, did you go to his trial then? I, I presume obviously he pled guilty. Uh, I did. And and it's, it was one of those rare occasions. I had a, a very strong, so, so I, essentially I did a prelim on him appearing in court. It, it was it was twenty it was it was twenty eighteen, right? And I and I did a prelim of him appearing in court. Now I knew he was gonna ple- it was very likely he was going to plead guilty. So we will have to stay within the rules of subjudice, but we went as strong as we could. I, I'm just trying to think did we put it in the front page? But we did say man is to go on trial because I had a very strong link that he was going to plead. 
Yeah, I recall it now. Yeah, I, I, I recall the. I certainly can recall a front page to that effect. Yeah. So um, that was obviously a huge day in court for the family of Irene White and, and for Anne um, to finally have a person uh, face justice and, and to be convicted. Can can you recall? I mean, obviously you were there, the atmosphere in court and the reaction of the family. Yes, it was January the um, 29th, 2018. So he was charged in January 2017. So we had to, and that's, that'd be quite normal, you know, yourself. You, it is about a year, sometimes more. So I knew he was going to plead guilty. So we were expecting it. So we were in the court and he was arraigned. So you know what arraigned means. You have to put the charge to them. The registrar puts the charge to him. And it's always not guilty. He just stood up and said, guilty judge. And I, I, I think you could feel the tension ebbing away in the courtroom. Guards were there. Journalists were there. Anne Delcassian and her husband, Kenny, was there. Alan White was there, the husband. So you could feel the sort of tension lifted. So it, we, I think we knew, you and I are privileged to be in cases like this. We really are, because you're seeing justice. You're seeing justice come and you're seeing the physical manifestation of justice. Do you, like, do you ever think about that? That it is, It's really an honour to be at these things. Yeah, I, I, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's never, it, it never becomes dull, does it? I mean, that moment. Uh, but just to see the reaction, I suppose, of the family, and, and I'd say for you covering that case um, from the beginning, I mean, it, um, I wonder. I wonder. Was there a feeling that at one stage that you would never see a day like that in court, and 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 just the relief, even for you as a reporter, just covering it to see such a moment? You, you, it's obviously a hugely significant moment. Yeah, I, I I didn't think like say from two thousand and five to well, we see. And here's the thing about the serious crime review team and the the, the phone call about Anthony Lamb. Nobody knew about that. That was kept very very tight. So we only knew about it at the time of his arrest in twenty seventeen. So. You heard whispers about, look, is there a bit of development or is there somebody? But you didn't know how strong it was because we're, we're, we're not privy to this. We have to feed for scraps. So I, I thought it was done and I thought there was a very, very, very minor chance in from 2005 to 2012, really, even after. I thought Anne, God love her, was putting up a decent fight, but there wasn't really a chance of a conviction. So it's always quite a, an amazing feeling to hear that there's, a suspect, to hear that the person's been arrested, to hear that they've got them banged to rights, to hear that they've admitted, admitted it, and to be there when they stand up and say, yeah, I killed her, Judge. I always find it a very powerful moment. And, you know, there's one other, I don't think I've really spoken about this, and I'd be interested in your view on this. There's an almost imperceptible moment when someone is convicted of murder or a very serious, and they're taken into custody, right? And I, I, I remember a guard, I said to a guard about this, see that moment when you go from being a citizen to being a convict and you're told, stay there and your liberty goes. It, 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 I sort of get butterflies looking at it, no matter who they are, on, a, on, on what they've done, just that sort of compassion on a, whatever they've done, that, that person is now a convict and cannot go to the toilet without asking. Do you ever notice that? It always gets me, I have to say. Yeah, something that always surprises me about those moments is is uh, it's not the case with everyone, but it, it like a huge number of people barely ever react, uh, at least visibly. And I don't know, is it because your brain is kind of scrambling to kind of understand that this is happening to me kind of thing? Well, a lot of people just go completely stone faced. I don't know how Anthony Lamb reacted, but a lot of that that's something that 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 always shocks me first, because you're looking for the reaction. And nine times out of 10, there is no reaction because it's almost like the person is in a state of shock. Yes, and that's a very important point. I Look, there are occasions when there's eruption in the courtroom or there's reaction from people in the public area. But the vast majority of cases, there's a dead calm. Do you know what I mean? It's not, there's no big explosion. It's just, okay. And there's nobody really reacts. I always find that interesting as well. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating, but I, I suppose it's just a moment of, of processing it, isn't it? I mean, even recalling the Regency trial recently, just the, the most recent example I can think of that Paul Murphy and Jason Bonney, there was just no reaction, you know? I mean, they, they had been free and on bail the entire time. And, and, and in that moment, OK, it was obviously uh, superseded by a, a more extraordinary moment of Jerry Hutch walking free. But there, I, I do recall thinking god it's mad like those two lads were in and out of the court every day now now they're not free that's it like their freedom is gone i do i do recall that feeling of geez that's strange and and not not sympathy but 
um yeah, you are mindful of it. Yeah, in in how extraordinary a moment it is for somebody. I would, yeah, I wouldn't say it's sympathy, but empathy. In other words, that's a human being, and their liberty is gone. And that's why I remember years ago I did a story about prisoners getting TVs in their cells. Okay, and and you know some people went nuts, but I was going, you know what? You've never been in prison. You've never had your liberty taken away from you. And it's the biggest thing for me. Let them have playstations. Let them have TVs. Let them have kettles. For me. The loss of your liberty is something massive. Yeah, yeah. Just to to be told what to do every day, and and um, yeah, to have that kind of strict regime on yourself, yeah, is it's 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 huge. Have you ever been in in a prison, Paul? I have. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been in prisons. In, oh, you have. So I've been in prisons in 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 Ireland and in Spain, right? And I get the heebie-jeebies because there's the walls, there's the corridors with all the locked doors and everything. It, it's unsettling. Mm. It is. And I mean, no matter those freedoms that you've mentioned about PlayStation and Netflix or whatever, they're, they're small liberties compared to, you know, the, the, the regime that you're under and, and, and the conditions of having to be around other prisoners as well. I mean, who might not necessarily be friendly towards you. And yeah, I, I can't imagine it. But um, I want to ask you just about, obviously, a person that we have not really mentioned here, which is... Uh, Irene White's husband, Alan, and you mentioned that he was in court that day. Um, and I can remember that you, I, I remember the front page that you doorstepped him and you approached him and you asked him very reasonable questions about what he made of all of this. And what what did he say to you? That was a great doorstep. It was, it's one of the best ones ever. So yeah, he was walking out and we just, we thought, fuck it, will we do it? Well, we did. So I went up and I recorded it. So the first question I asked him was just his reaction. You know, I think he mumbled something. But then the court heard that there were two men involved in orchestrating and paying for the murder. So I asked him his reaction to that. And he said he was shocked at that. And then we quite reasonably asked him, and he reasonably answered, to be fair, that uh, some people were claiming that he was involved in, in the murder. And he shrugged his shoulders and said, he can't speak for what people believe him. And then I asked him what he thought about the, the the verdict. And he said, we got the result that we needed. So it was a great doorstep because we didn't think he was going to say anything because he had been sort of quite steadfast. Now, he's done a couple of interviews later, uh, later on. We can talk about that. But yeah, it was great. that. But uh, even that wasn't the been it wasn't going to be the splash because our splash, which is really important, was the splash the next day was... I had information that uh, Lamb had fingered two men and that he was going to bring them to justice. And that was really, really significant. Mm. Well, I, I, I can remember this because I remember thinking, um, I suppose in a way, this is what every journalist wants to happen. Uh, it's, it's what journalism is about. about it shows that uh, journalism can be impactful. Um, and it was that particular front page story that had a huge impact, didn't it? Because it caused somebody to have a moment of clarity and uh, come forward. So, what can you what can you tell us about that? Yes. So, so essentially, this so essentially the story was two more men are going to be are going to be done. Lamb has pointed the fingers at them, and he's going to give evidence. I think he used the word he's fingered them or whatever, right? So, I was sitting in the office. I think you were we were all there, you know. When we, yeah, and I just got to be messy to say, Nal Powers handed himself in. I went, what? And essentially, we haven't been able to name him so far. Nal Power was one of two men that Anthony Lamb said orchestrated and ordered him to carry out the murder. So essentially, our paper came out at seven o'clock in the morning or whatever, you know. <coughs> essentially, about half ten, this businessman, Nal Parr, who was a, a business partner of, for, a former, former business partner of Alan White, walked into Dundalk Garda Station, knocked on the public uh, office window and said, I want to confess. So, um, it came as a shock for Gardy because the guards were working on a plan against him. But he, he took the initiative, went in, and it was like, Jesus. So they brought him in the initiative room and he spilled his guts. And he essentially admitted orchestrating and paying uh, Lamb to carry out the murder. So it was pretty sensational. So I, I didn't know at the time. And it was only sometime later that somebody said, Look, Mick, it was your story. He read your story, realized he was ghost. And decided to hand himself in. But the view is he was trying to save his skin. Maybe what you said about Lamb reeling really his ghost and thought, right, maybe I can get some time shaved off. 
very unlikely, but the view with Lamb is because he's so selfish, or sorry, with uh, power, that he's so selfish and self-centred that he was scheming because he knew the game was up because he knew Lamb was going to have his kids. So he tried to be proactive in the hope that there would, years down the road, he would get some benefit for that. Interesting. And I wonder, did he think, you know, the guards, they, they don't really want me. They want the mastermind and I can give them what they want. <sighs> well, I knew, I, I, yes, but he knew the game was up for him. He knew he was going to let life down for murder. So who knows what could through his, a killer's mind. But he knew the game was up and he went in and he confessed. So, you know, that's, that, I think that was a great day for us. And it shows the power of the press. It does, absolutely. But what was his level of involvement? Uh, obviously, he didn't physically carry out the murder, but his level of involvement was that he was essentially a middleman, right? That he was the guy that told Anthony Lamb to carry it out. So even the person who actually masterminded the whole thing didn't necessarily have the direct contact with, uh, with Lamb. Yes, it was. How can I put this? Power was the chief executive. And the other person was the chairman. So Parr was putting pressure on Lamb to carry it out. Parr was giving him the money. Parr promised him the 30 grand. Parr sourced him and Parr threatened him. And, pa- and you know, Lamb believed Parr would kill him if he didn't. So he really, really played a central role to this. It's like operating almost like an organised crime gang, isn't it? Like it's 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 that level of, of pressure and, and, and th- threats, you know, Um to make somebody carry out the most horrendous crime. Um, I, I suppose the obvious question is why, for me, why has the mastermind not yet been arrested and charged? Uh, given that there are two people now that I, I, they must have fingered him at this point and must have said uh, that they were involved in the conspiracy with him and that he was the director of the whole plot. So what has stopped Gardy from arresting and charging this person? Well, he has been arrested previously. OK, and we know that Gardy have prepared a file for the director of public prosecutions. The DPP, as we said at the start, the DPP has that. So the guards, just to explain the way it works with a file, the DPP, there's usually a request, a recommendation. We recommend that X be charged with Y. And that's the case in this. The guards have asked for this man to be charged. DPP is considering it. There is a difficulty. Lamb indicated very strongly he would give evidence. Uh, power the same but when you're in prison and this was explained to me when you're in prison your mind and focus changes because you're afraid of being seen as a rat and I think with Lamb there was definitely a worry that he would be attacked not by any of the mastermind's friends or anything just your internal reputation would be that of a rat so you know prison does focus the mind and my belief is that he is or was reluctant to give evidence because he worried for his own safety in prison how that could be affect his brand inside. So, look, I, I, I personally think they will give evidence against him, but I think they'll have to be persuaded. So we'll have to see. But that unlike, it, unlike uh, I suppose, to give, to give a, a recent example, unlike Jonathan Dowdall, as a, as a, as a state witness, they don't have anything to necessarily gain, do they? I mean, they're both serving life sentences for murder. So um, there might be kind of a sense of what do I have to gain from getting on the stand? I have everything to lose in terms of my safety. The only thing I can suggest, and it's not a deal, is obviously they go before before the parole board. After 12 years, you can you apply for parole. So, you know, the parole board does take things into account, like you admit your guilt, which both men have. They pleaded guilty. And, you know, if you help the state and if you help the state nail the other man, they probably would and they have remorse and everything. So... That can mean the difference with them serving 15 years compared to 25. So, you know, that might benefit them. With, and so it's not technically a deal. It's just this, the, the parole board would take this into account, put it that, way, that they have been remorseful and they have been upstanding members of society. I just want to talk about one thing very quickly. Power was jailed for life in July 2019. So from 2017 to 2019, two people were fingered, arrested, charged, convicted and pleaded. Okay. And Cassian was there for both those men. In 2018, she developed incurable cancer. And sadly, just a month after Parr was convicted, Anne lost her, her fight for life. So she didn't see the mastermind convicted. And I, I think it is fair. It was her dad wished that that happened. But she saw two of the killers convicted. So that must have been a great feeling for her. And she deserves massive credit for her campaign because she did keep the case in the public eye. Absolutely. And, and you'd wonder... 
had she not done that, would 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 she ever have seen justice? You know, it's sad that she had to t- to bear that burden, but uh, she's incredibly brave and strong having done that, and and it's just sad that she didn't get to see that that mastermind charged. There is there is one thing I'd like to say. I mean, we have mentioned the reaction to my story in the star about how that prompted your man Parr to hand himself in. But it also has to be said, Barry Cummins' piece was very important, sort of the look back, the historic case, because it was after that that uh, Lamb's ex-girlfriend effectively rang Crime Stoppers or made anonymous phone calls. So, you know, media coverage does affect cases. People do read cases and it does spark something. We could be writing a story in five years' time and that could cause... A, a crisis of conscience for somebody. So I, I thought it was very important. The media aspect was very important here. Yeah, it shows you the power of the press. It, it hasn't gone. I, I do wonder and I do feel for Irene White's children and I know her daughter, one of her daughters has spoken out in recent times as well looking for justice. Um, they're essentially now carrying that flame, aren't they? They're keeping um, her name alive. They're, they're, they're looking for that kind of justice. I, I wonder about the conscience of this mastermind and, and whether whether he sees you know the road running out now for him as you've mentioned the, the guards want to charge him um yeah will he will he have that same crisis of conscience and come forward or is 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 there evidence to the contrary given that he hasn't come forward in, in all of this time and the evidence doesn't seem to be leading any other way yes i don't think it's there's any chance of this man having a crisis of conscience now, their famous last words could happen tomorrow, but I think it's very unlikely because he stayed stum this long. He has seen Anthony Lamb being convicted and jailed. He has seen Nal Parr being convicted and changed. So if it would have happened, it's more than likely that it would have happened now. But look, I think the road is running out for him. I personally think he will be charged. Now, it's up to DPP. But if I were to be a betting man, I would call it that he will be charged. So who knows when it'll happen. Well, if and when that happens, we'll we'll definitely be talking about it and covering it. Um, yes, uh, sorry, something else we just want to mention uh, is, I believe you um, just in doing this podcast, you you reached out to um, to to Irene White's brother in law, and and he has given you a statement. Yes, yeah, so Kenny Del Cassian, who would be Anne's husband, like like the other family members, he's been keeping the flame going. So he did get, he didn't want to appear on the, the podcast today, but he did. Uh, gives a few comments. Um, one thing that struck me, and it's a very valid point, he talked about Maureen, Irene's mother, finding the body. And he made a very good point that if Maureen had chanced upon this murder while it was happening, it's very likely Lamb would have killed Maureen as well because she was a witness. And that, that I thought it was just the first time I've written that down. And it, for me, it was quite chilling. And, and, and I think he's right. He would have killed her. But we, we, we know, so he, so there's going to, a small piece that I am going to read out, but we do know Anne Del Castian believed there were seven or eight people involved in the conspiracy. But we know that there are, there's the mastermind, there's Nal Parr, and there's Anthony Lamb. So uh, Kenny sent me a message and he said, it is not just three involved. It is also those who provided the alibis, who drove the car for the car driven, who, do, who cleaned the car that was covered in blood, who cleaned or he helped Lamb get rid of the blood afterwards before he flew to the UK. And he says the Guardi are being slow in all aspects of bringing the Kang to the courts, but that is due to the benefits of some in the gang not yet being charged, also being informants on criminality in the border area. I don't know, that's, that's Kenny's view. And he says, as Af- Anne often said, every one of them, it doesn't matter how far they run. Guardy will get them. So he's very hopeful that other people will be brought to justice. Uh, that, that's extraordinary. I suppose we're talking about this mastermind, but but obviously from, from Ken's perspective, there are others there um, who, who he wants to see brought to justice who have been implicated in it. Uh, a plot, a conspiracy on that level. You mentioned, I think, seven or eight people uh, up to, you know. So there are people out there with information Um you know, but but it, I suppose for the family, the most important thing is getting justice, and um, you, you that comes across in that statement that they still have very very strong feelings about the investigation so far. Yeah, and I I do think their goal 
has always been to get their mastermind. I'm not saying they're unhappy about the killer and Nal Power being done, but they're folk. I think they'll be disappointed if their mastermind isn't done. And put it that way. Well, look, let's hope that happens. Uh, it makes me fascinating to talk to you about this case. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to follow it with interest. We're going to do... Um, a couple of podcasts like this uh, focusing back on on some some cases which are solved and or partially solved and unsolved cases um and if people have any suggestions uh, you can send us a dm on twitter so thanks very much thanks everybody